The History of Torture by Daniel P. Mannix, Chapter 2. The first people to use not only torture but mass extermination as a definite military policy were the Assyrians. Although other peoples had frequently massacred their defeated adversaries, the massacre was usually performed in the heat of combat or done as a sacrifice to the tribal god, as was apparently the extermination of the inhabitants of Jericho by the Jews. The Assyrians went about the business systematically using torture and wholesale massacre hmm, wholesale, to frighten other nations into surrendering. Judging from their bas-reliefs, I hope it's called, pronounced bas-relief because that's what I've been using in all of the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets th lyrics. Judging from their bas-reliefs, they were extremely proud of their methods used and portrayed them in great detail. The simplest method was simply to brain the prisoner with a mace. Kadong! The prisoner was forced to kneel with his hands placed before him on a block. One executioner held him by a cord around the neck while the other seized his back hair in one hand and struck him with the iron-headed club. Decapitation of living men was less common, although the warriors uh, collected as many heads from corpses as possible after a battle. A soldier's pay seemingly depended on the number of heads he was able to produce. Oh, then how many can you, how many heads can you carry around after a battle? Severed heads were also used as lawn ornaments. A relief from Nineveh shows King Asurbanipal dining in the garden with his queen while the heads of defeated monarchs dangle from the trees. When a living man was to be decapitated, he stood upright, and the executioner, holding him by the hair with one hand, struck off his head with a short sword. Plus one. Mutilation was also practiced. Asur Nazarpal, Asur Nazarpal, not Asur Banapal, but Asur, Asur Nazarpal, boasted in his inscriptions of cutting off the noses and ears of prisoners and blinding them with red hot irons. A relief of Asur Banapal's shows a prisoner being held by one executioner while another tears out his tongue. Flaying was also used. The victim was spread eagled between four stakes driven into the ground. Apparently, the skin was either used as a trophy or made into coverings for chairs, somewhat like the human skin lampshades of Buchenwald. The most dramatic form of tortures, and judging from the reliefs, the one most commonly used, was impalement. The sharpened stake was fixed into the ground, and the victim impaled on it with the point entering his body just below the breastbone. Oh, not all the way through. When attacking a city, the Assyrian would impale their prisoners within sight of the city walls, so the besieged would know what fate awaited them if they refused to surrender. Later, the Romans employed crucifixion for the same purpose. The effectiveness of wholesale terror tactics has never been determined. They are intended to frighten the enemy into surrender, but on the other hand, they may stimulate a desperate last-ditch resistance either because the enemy is, fur is infuriated by the sight of such horrors and wishes to retaliate, or because he knows what his own fate will be. During the last war, Germany distributed thousands of feet of film showing the destruction of Warsaw, Antwerp, and Brussels as a warning to other nations contemplating resistance. Our information service used footage from these same films, films to stiffen Allied resistance, arguing that people would rather die than yield to such monsters. Who was right? Question mark. There have been a number of historical cases where, when massive retaliation was admittedly disastrous. One outstanding example was the Athenian destruction of Melos in 416 BC. The island of Melos had refused to join the Delian League. Oh, yes, the Delian League. Uh, so Athens sent her fleet to force obedience. After a desperate resistance, the island was taken. The Athenians killed all the men, sold the women and children as slaves, and resettled the island with Athenian colonists. But the other Greek city-states never forgave Athens this act of tyranny. From then on, the once proud city of Pericles, instead of being the leader of a group of loyal supporters, was forced to operate as an empire ruling reluctant colonies. On the other hand, 80 years later, Alexander the Great successfully crushed all opposition in Greece by totally destroying Thebes and selling the inhabitants into slavery. From the point of view of Alexander, this ruthlessness was highly effective. Even when Alexander and his army were in India, no Greek city dared to rise against him. 
Terror tactics are still employed, and their effectiveness still remains in doubt. On June 10, 1942, the Germans, in reprisal for the murder of Reinhard Heydrich, killed every adult male in Lidice, I hope it's pronounced Lidice, and deported all women and children. Maybe it's, maybe it's Ladice. I don't think it's Ladice. The town was then razed and the ground plowed up as Rome destroyed Carthage 3,402 years before. After the invasion of Tibet by the Chinese, thousands of men, women, and children were murdered, murdered in an attempt to stamp out resistance. The Israelis have launched frequent reprisal raids into Arab territory, one of the most outstanding being the attack on Kibya, 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 Q-I-B-Y-A, on October 14, 1953, in retaliation for the killing of an Israeli woman and her two children in Tirat Yebuda two days before. The Israeli troops destroyed Kibya, killing 66 people, two-thirds of whom were women and children. The American use of the atomic bomb against Japan during the last war is regarded by many as a terror tactic. There would seem to be no general rule that can be universally applied to all terror tactics. The massacre of Lidice apparently served no useful purpose. The underground continued to operate unaffected. But Rome's destruction of Carthage eliminated a dangerous commercial and military rival and established Rome as the greatest power in the western Mediterranean world. China's ruthless treatment of the Tibetans would seem to have been highly successful, and surprisingly enough, other Asian nations apparently do not resent this holocaust. Unquestionably, Israel's policy of reprisals has discouraged Arab raiding, and, you, and our use of the atomic bomb did hasten the surrender of Japan. But there have been many cases uh, when ruthlessness caused nothing but undying hatreds. The massacre of St. Bartholomew, for example. During the Indian Mutiny of 1857, the massacre of Kanpur of several hundred English men, women, and children by the orders of the Nana Sahib accomplished nothing except to provoke the English to far more extensive atrocities at Allahabad, when, as T.R. Holmes says, Oh, T.R. Holmes. Old men who had done us no harm and helpless women with suckling infants at their breasts felt the weight of our vengeance. In general, however, it may be said that if the purpose of massacre is simply to clear an area of a certain group, it can be done successfully. When the Iroquois were virtually exterminated by Morgan's rifles after the American Revolution because they supported the British... This act unquestionably laid open all northern New York State to white settlement and protected us from Indian raids during the War of 1812. Us. Whoever us is. When the Israelis speeded the flight of over a million Arabs from Israel, they rid themselves of a possible subversive group and at the same time confiscated much valuable farmland for Jewish settlers. But when the purpose of terror tactics is merely to intimidate a group the better to exploit them, such methods are more doubtful. Algerian colons hmm, often quote our treatment of the Indians or the Israelis' handling of the Arabs to justify a policy of relentless suppression toward the Algerians, but they ignore the fact that they need the Arabs as a source of cheap labor. Neither the American colonists nor the Israelis were attempting to create a peon class to do manual labor for them. When such a group greatly outnumbers the ruling class, as is typically the case in most European colonies, a policy of brutal repression usually becomes impractical. The Assyrians introduced the custom of transplanting conquered peoples from one area to another to prevent uprisings, and this te technique was continued by the Babylonians. The Babylonians also introduced the custom of throwing prisoners into a fiery furnace. Daniel 3 and exposing them to wild beasts, Daniel 6.16. Apparently, the Babylonians were not so systematically ruthless as the Assyrians, but they could be vindictively cruel on occasion. Prisoners were castrated to serve as eunuchs. Uh, 2 Kings 20.18. Uh, do I need to read these references to the Bible? I don't think so. The children of King Zedekiah were killed before his eyes, and the king then blinded, while even officials of the court lived in terror. In theory, the Persian maintained a comparatively lenient legal code, 
No one could be put to death for a single crime, and the rights of the individual were guaranteed. But in practice, as the king was an absolute monarch, the law was frequently ignored. According to one story, a Persian monarch asked a favorite courtier to taste a special stew. When the courtier praised the dish, the king asked him if he would like to see what animal composed it. The courtier expressed polite interest, whereupon a silver salver... A salver? What's a salver? Let's find out what a salver is, everybody. Definition of salver. Well, it is a tray. Okay. <laughs> Typically one made of silver and used in formal circumstances. Silver, salver, tray. It's a silver tray. A salver. Great. A silver salver was brought in, and when the cover was removed, the head and crossed hands of the courtier's son was revealed. Yeah, see, what do you think of the stew now? asked the monarch. The well-trained courtier replied, I think whatever it pleases my lord the king to have me think. In addition to the other tortures previously mentioned, the Persians had their prisoners flayed alive, crucified, buried up to the neck, and slowly crushed between stones. They were also sometimes burned alive. Croesus, king of Lydia, or possibly Lydia, had once boasted to the philosopher Solon of his great wealth, but Solon had replied, No man can be truly happy. Later, Lydia was conquered by, or Lydia, was conquered by Cyrus the Great, who ordered Croesus burned at the stake. While the executioners were lighting the faggots, Croesus cried out, Solon, how right you were! Cyrus became curious and asked the doomed man what he meant. When Cyrus heard the story, he remarked, I'm a man too, and your fate today may be mine tomorrow. He made the deposed monarch an official at his court. The most elaborate of the Persian punishments was known as the boat. Plutarch gives a de detailed account of this terrible death. Artaxerxes II was engaged in a battle with his brother Cyrus for the Persian throne. Oh, this is, this, is this Cyrus the Great? A young Persian named Mithridates struck Cyrus with a javelin and inflicted a mortal wound. But it flattered Artaxerxes' vanity to think that he had killed Cyrus single-handed. Unfortunately for Mithridates, he got drunk at a feast and boasted of his deed. When his boast was repeated to the king, Mithridates was sen sentenced to die by the boat. Plutarch says, The execution is performed like this. Two boats are used that exactly fit. The prisoner is put on his back in one of them, and the other is laid on top of it, but with the man's arms and feet outside, while the rest of his body is inside the two boats. They then offer him food, and if he refuses it, they force him to eat by pricking his eyes. How does that force somebody to eat? I lose my appetite immediately. Then they drench him with a mixture of milk and honey, pouring it not only in his mouth, but all over his face. They keep his face constantly turned toward the sun, and it becomes completely covered by the swarms of flies that settle on it. Wait a minute, isn't his face inside the boat? I'm confused. That's all right. Uh, and as within the boats, he does that which all who eat and drink must do. I think that means pooping. Creeping things and vermins spring out of the corruption and rottenness of the excrement, and these enter into his bowels and slowly eat him away. That doesn't make sense. Is this a spontaneous combustion, or spontaneous, what is it, poop maggots? When he is dead and the upper boat removed, his body is a mass of maggots and swarms of insects are preying on him, growing in his innards. In his way, Mithridates, after suffering for seventeen days, at last expired. Ordinarily, Artaxerxes was not so fiendishly vindictive. He condemned one man who had run away during the battle to carry a prostitute around the market square on his back, one of the most curious punishments on record. Uh, yeah, and for the prostitute, what does she do? Another man, who had falsely boasted of having killed two of Cyrus's soldiers, was punished by having two needles thrust through his tongue. As Oriental tortures went, this was hardly more than horseplay. Oh, Oriental, you say. The ancient Greeks were not an inherently cruel people, and, although given to occasional outbreaks of mob hysteria, they took no delight in inflicting pain. 
The concept of retribution made a strong appeal to them, and Theseus's deeds on the famous journey from the Peloponnesus to Athens are simply acts of justice, according to the Lex Talionis, which is a book, I guess. His two most famous encounters were with Sinus and Procrustes. Yes, the breakfast cereal that's part of this complete breakfast. Procrustes. Sinus, also known as the Bender, used to bend down two young pine trees, fasten his victims between them, and then let the pines spring back into position. I saw that in a Tarzan movie. Uh, except they were palm trees. Theseus, order, uh, Theseus forced him to suffer the same fate. Procrustes, <laughs> a bed that perfectly fitted all corners. What? If the man was too short, Procrustes had him stretched out as though on a rack. If too long, his limbs were cut off until he was the right size. I don't get it. Theseus forced Procrustes to fit his own bed. Theseus claimed he was merely following the example of Hercules. Winner of song and story, Hercules. Winner of ancient glory. Uh, who also specialized in making the punishment fit the crime. The Greeks used the wheel as a rack. Aristophanes in Lysistrata says... What a convulsion and a straining of every limb I feel. All the world is though I were being racked on the wheel. And flogging was employed. Such punishments were usually limited to slaves. The ancient Greeks, at least, did not employ elaborate or grotesque punishments. A man condemned to death was usually allowed to commit suicide by drinking hemlock. But still, that's nasty. And execution of criminals were not public displays as with the Romans. But during the age of tyrants, roughly the 6th century BC... There were occasional sadists. The man whose name has come down to us as a personification of cruelty was Phalaris, with a PH, the tyrant of Arg 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 Agrigentum in Sicily. Agrigentum? Agrigentum. An Athenian named Perillus invented a brass bull, so constructed that when a man was put inside and a fire lighted under the image, the man's cries came from the mouth of the bull and gave the impression that the statue was roaring. Perillus presented his bull to Phalaris, expecting a rich reward, but the tyrant responded by ordering Perillus put inside to test the invention. It worked perfectly! Perillus was the first of numerous inventors of torture devices who, according to tradition, died by their own invention, although possibly the popular delight in poetic justice and the Lex Talionis have colored the accounts. Legend says that the people of Ar Agrigentum later revolted and roasted the tyrant in the same device. Another outstanding Greek sadist was Nabis of Sparta, 207 BC, who conceived an idea so grotesque that it has fascinated sadists ever since. According to Polybius, oh, Polybius, what does your voice sound like? Feeling tired, let's do a pirate. Yar, har, har. He made the statue, magnificently dressed, in the image of his beautiful wife, Apiga. When he wished to extract money from anyone, he would invite the man to have dinner at his home and ask him for the money, explaining the number of mercenaries uh, he was forced to retain, and so on. If the man refused, Nabis would say, then perhaps Apiga can persuade ye. Nabus then would push the man toward the image whose breasts, hands, and arms were full of spikes concealed under their clothes. Oh, Nabus, by pressing a secret spring, caused the statue to open her arms and seize the man. He was then squeezed until he promised to pay or died. This statue was doubtless the origin of the famous Iron Maiden of the Middle Ages. Although the Greeks in general did not delight in cruelty, they were subject, especially the Athenians, to outbreaks of mass hysteria, much like modern lynch mobs. Two outstanding examples were the destruction of Melos in 416 BC and the legal murder of Socrates. That's right, I said it. All right, that's chapter two. I will see you next time. Thanks for listening. I'll see you later.